In the beginning, God, the love of our souls, the source of goodness, truth, and justice, a perfect kingdom of love and light. Until war broke out in heaven through one fallen angel who broke God's perfect law, Lucifer coveted God's throne and authority and deceived one third of the angels to rebel against the Holy One. Since that time, Earth is a war zone where the forces of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and deceit battle it out in a life or death conflict. Are you just a spectator or have you taken sides? Are you living the victorious life God intended for you to have? Let Marla Alona guide you through the truth of God's Word, that you may choose right, that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and that God's truth may bring you eternal life. Welcome to Setting the Record Straight, God's Truth for This Generation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. In today's program, I'll be discussing the significance of the name of our newly elected U.S. President Donald Trump in relation to Bible prophecy for the end time. It's fascinating that Trump's name is so rich in meaning, both in the secular meaning of the word and in the biblical meaning of the word. Personally, I don't think that's a coincidence. I submit to you that possibly Donald Trump's name might be a sign from God with prophetic meaning. I believe that God might have a very important end time message for his people through the name of Donald Trump. Only God, who knows the end from the beginning, who knows his divine calendar, is able to provide this kind of sign that is fully consistent with Bible practice starting in the book of Genesis. So we're going to get additional insight into the end time scenario of Bible prophecy that's being played out right now on the world stage as we do this analysis. The second part of the teaching, which is the relationship between the trump of God and the heavenly sanctuary and the calendar of the sanctuary, is critically important for you to get. So I want to make sure that you remain with us until the very end. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Get ready for some strong meat today, as the Apostle Paul would say, because the days of milk are over. We all need to become wise unto salvation, and the only way to do that is to go even deeper into God's Word. Let's get started. Significance of the Recent U.S. Selections Contrary to what many prophecy teachers would have us believe, the truth is that the U.S. plays a leading role in end-time prophecy. Not Israel, not Islam, but the U.S. will be leading out in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Now that doesn't mean to say that historic and even unprecedented things won't happen in the rest of the world or in the Middle East, because they're happening even now. But it simply means that we particularly need to watch and study what's happening in the U.S. because this country, not the Middle East, this country is the nerve of the war between Jesus and Satan. The U.S. is still in upheaval after the recent presidential elections, isn't it? And I would agree with every single news analyst, every commentator that has called this recent elections historic. I would add that the Lord used this past election to make a statement. Let me give you an example. Do you remember in 2013 when Pope Benedict XVI resigned? A few hours after Pope Benedict announced his resignation, which was in itself right, was a historic occurrence that hadn't been seen in over 600 years, a bolt of lightning struck the Vatican Basilica. That clearly was a sign from God saying, wake up and watch. What is happening here is significant. Something very similar happened with the 2016 U.S. presidential election and Donald Trump's victory. Not that any bolts of lightning came down from heaven, but there were some ways in which this U.S. election was noteworthy, and we should sit up and take notice. What are those ways? Number one, one of the candidates was a Seventh-day Adventist. Dr. Ben Carson is a practicing Seventh-day Adventist who ran for president. He was eliminated in the primaries. 
His faith generated a lot of interest and controversy. And even Donald Trump was asking, who are Adventists? All of a sudden, this very unique Christian denomination was in the limelight. And we'll learn in another study why this is significant. Number two, the real issue at stake in the election was globalism versus nationalism. We did a deep study on this when we did our uh, prophecy update at the end of last year, right? When we uh, looked at the year in review in the light of Bible prophecy. So we understand that the global powers, the global elite, are like the Tower of Babel builders. They're rising up, trying to rise up a centralized world government in opposition to God's stated will, which is disperse, which is uh, spread out. No, they want to centralize and they want to build a tower of power against the Lord, in rebellion against the Lord. So during this election, they were rallying to what they thought was a landslide victory, and instead, the people, and I wonder if God possibly put Donald Trump with his nationalist agenda in office. So at least let's, we can speculate about whether that was an act of God or not, although we do know that the Lord sets up kings and removes kings, but he also allows things to happen. Sometimes he allows things to happen without getting directly involved. So we don't really know what the reality is. We can only speculate on that point. But what is clear is that the people put Donald Trump in office, especially Christians. Let me give you some statistics. According to Crux Now, which is a Catholic news website, 52% of Catholics and 81% of Protestants voted for Donald Trump. Now, by Trump coming into office, the Democratic plan, which was pretty much to launch World War III against Putin and the Russians, was stopped, or at least it was temporarily hindered or delayed. And I wonder, did God put Trump in power as a bump in the road for the globalists? And the reason I ask this is, is this another example of God asking the four angels from the book of Revelation to hold back the winds of strife until all of God's people are sealed? I don't have the answer, but I think these are fair questions to ask. Number three. As we said earlier, the very name Trump is a word with rich meaning. It has great biblical significance. And we're going to explore this in more detail right now so that we can make some connections. The secular meaning of the word Trump. If you look up the word Trump in any English dictionary, you'll find that it has several meanings. Number one, it's associated with cards and winning. A Trump card is a valuable resource that may be used, especially as a surprise, in order to gain an advantage. Often a decisive overriding factor or final resource. Number two, to Trump means to surpass something by saying or doing something better. Number three, it means an advantage held in reserve until needed, also to get the better of someone using some hidden resource. And number four, the expression to come up trumps means to have a better performance or a better outcome than expected. Now, it's interesting that we see some of these meanings playing out in the life of Trump, right? In his, in his um, biography and his destiny, we can see some of that. Um, being manifested. Now, what is the advantage that Trump had in the election that gave him the victory? Again, we don't know for sure, but some of the commentators and analysts um, hypothesize that possibly the polite support of the silent majority, who didn't argue, who didn't try to persuade anyone, but they simply went to the, vote, to the polls and they voted. The silent majority was Trump's decisive and overriding factor and the final resource that put him in power, but it escaped notice during the campaign and it only became apparent in the vote counting. Again, I'm citing 
news analysts and commentators as I give you this analysis. The Biblical Meaning of Trump Now, I think this is even more fascinating. In the Bible, names are very significant. They signify the character or the nature of the person being named or what the person represents. When we know the meaning of a character's name, we get a deeper understanding of Bible stories, especially in the book of Genesis. Let me give you just a few examples. Adam comes from the Hebrew word Adoma and means man. Eve means life or life-giving or mother of all who have life. Babel in Hebrew means to confuse or confound. So Babel and its derivative word Babylon are associated with confusion. Nimrod, the founder of the Tower of Babel, that was erected in rebellion against God, right? The mighty hunter before God. The word Nimrod means rebel or rebellion. In Hebrew, Isaac is laughter. Remember how Sarai laughed when God announced that she would have a son? The Lord instructed Abraham to name him Isaac. Jacob's name is explained as meaning supplanter because he deprived his brother of his rights as the firstborn son. You all know the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob stole his brother's birthright as the, as the eldest, and Jacob's name means supplanter. Now, one of the most extraordinary names of all is Methuselah. The name Methuselah has a prophetic meaning. In the Old Testament, Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Remember Enoch who walked with God and whom God translated to heaven without dying. Well, the Lord told Enoch that as long as his son was alive, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. But as soon as Methuselah died, the flood would be sent forth. Enoch named his son to reflect this prophecy that God had given him. And the name Methuselah comes from two roots. Muth, a root that means death, and shalach, which means to bring or to send forth. Thus, the name Methuselah signifies his death shall bring. Literally, his death shall bring. And indeed, in the year that Methuselah died, the flood came. His death brought forth the flood exactly as prophesied. Okay, so with that context, now that we understand the, the importance of names in the Bible, the word Trump, let's analyze that word. It appears four times in the Bible, twice in the Old Testament, twice in the New Testament. Now the word trumpet is a variation of the word Trump and has the same meaning. The word trumpet appears 49 times in the singular, and in the plural, the word trumpets appears almost as many times. So we're talking about a word that appears in the Bible approximately a hundred times. Clearly, this is an important word, and it stands for something important. So what are the meanings associated with the word trump in the Bible? Let's do a deep dive. Let me share with you what I found. Number one, the word trump or trumpet is associated with war or destruction. It's an alarm or an alert that precedes a war, an invasion, or some other form of destruction. The trumpet calls the people to be vigilant, to assemble, to muster their forces against an attack. Number two, associated with judgment for sin and transgression and for turning away from God. So associated with judgment. Often the judgment came by the sword, meaning by war, and often the danger to Israel came from the north, from the kingdom of Babylon. Now this is significant because of the prophecy in Daniel 11 regarding the king of the north, which refers to the Antichrist. Number three, the word trump or trumpet is associated with God coming down from heaven. In the Old Testament, the trumpet blared when the Lord came down to Mount Sinai to speak the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. This is in Exodus 19 and 20. 
There was smoke and fire on the mountain as well as a great earthquake. Equally, in the New Testament, the trump is associated with the second coming of Christ when he will come with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God to gather up his elect from the four winds. This is 1 Thessalonians 4. As happened on Mount Sinai, there will be smoke and fire and a great earthquake that will move the islands out of their place. So big an earthquake it will be. And number four, the trump or trumpet are associated with the voice of God. At Mount Sinai, the blast of the trumpet was commingled with God's voice. This is Exodus 19.19. 19. In Zechariah 9.14, the Lord himself blows the trumpet, and Christ comes with the voice of the archangel in the vo and the voice of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, that's the scripture we mentioned earlier, just now. And the trumpet is also associated with the voice of the prophets, which we read about in the book of Isaiah. Let's read now a few selected verses from Jeremiah 4. This is a very important chapter where we clearly get the sense of the alert, the impending doom, the judgment of God. And we even get a preview of the end of the world. Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together, and say, assemble yourselves, and let us go into the fortified cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail, for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Now I want you to notice how this transitions to the famous passage in the same chapter, Jeremiah 4, where the prophet now gets a vision of the end of the world. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Now let's just add a couple more scriptures related to the trump or the trumpet that are very well-known verses from the New Testament. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. Well, as you can see, the study of the trumpets is wonderful. It's rich and uh, beautiful. And unfortunately, we can only do a small sampling here of verses, but all the scriptures that we read, which are related to trump or trumpet, are confirming and reinforcing the themes that we identified earlier. War, judgment by the sword, impending destruction, call for God's people to assemble, end of the world, God coming down from heaven and speaking to the people. Now, for God's people who are walking with him, we have nothing to fear 
of the sound of the trumpet. If we are prepared, if we live every day as if it were our last, the trumpet brings victory. As in the tumbling of the walls of Jericho. You know the story, right? The children of Israel circled around Jericho for six days, one, once a day. On the seventh day, they circled the city seven times. And at the last uh, time, as uh, promised by the Lord, when they blew the trumpets and when they gave a great shout, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. It was a huge victory for God's people because that was the first fruit of the, of the promised land. Jericho was the first stronghold that they took of the promised land. For us, for our generation, the trumpet means the victory of God's faithful people being gathered up, God's elect being gathered up from the four winds to meet the Lord in the air. So we have nothing to fear of the trumpet, again, if we are walking faithfully with the Lord and we are prepared. But for those who are unfaithful to God, to those who are in the world, to those who are in rebellion against God, the trumpet always signals destruction. Checkmate. Let's go back now to what we were saying about the secular meaning of the word trump. Again, it's associated with games and winning, right? Having a decisive advantage. Now, I want us to take a step back and look at the big picture. We said earlier, Trump is smart. He was able to garner the vote of a majority of Christians, both Catholics and Protestants. According to some reports I read, he's had a recent conversion experience, which is very interesting, and that may very well be. Now, did you notice how at the inauguration, Trump had a bigger than normal team of religious leaders praying for him? He had a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic priest, an evangelical pastor, and a female spiritual advisor. So Trump may or may not be religious, but he certainly surrounded himself with a very representative group of religious leaders. What's the connection here? What is this telling us? Well, let's go back to the Bible. We know, and, and let me just say this, um, there's a caveat which is to interpret prophecy in the light of current events. We never want to do that. That is a sure path to error. What we always want to do is interpret current events in the light of prophecy, right? That's a critical teaching. I want you to really get this um, because it can really lead us down a false path if we try to interpret Bible prophecy in the light of what's happening. No, we do the opposite. We interpret what's happening in the light of prophecy. And it's not always easy because we don't have enough perspective, right? It's right in our faces to really analyze it properly. So I, that's why I'm, these are all questions I'm asking myself, right? I'm intrigued by what's going on with Trump. And so I'm asking myself all these questions in the light of Bible prophecy. And I'm sharing this questioning process with you because I think it's interesting. And I think this is how we need to always be looking at current events, thinking to prophecy and seeing, you know, how is this playing out? But I'm not affirming anything or I'm not making any strong statements at this point. It's too early to say. Let's talk about the U.S. and Bible prophecy. We know that in the book of Revelation, the end time beast that rose out of the earth represents the U.S. This beast is described in Revelation 13. It has two horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. And now there, no matter what school of Bible prophecy you're with, every single school of Bible prophecy understands this beast the same way it represents the U.S. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Let's quickly read the passage. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So this is telling us that this, 
this beast power, this U.S. beast power, is even going to be able to do false miracles, right? False signs and wonders, fire coming down from heaven, deception, great deception. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, what is the image of the beast? The image of the beast represents apostate Protestantism, also called the false prophet in another uh, chapter in Revelation. Let's continue. He, meaning the beast, the, the beast that rises up from the land, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, this means everyone, this is a universal decree, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the beast or the number of his name. So this is all in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18. In other words, what we're waiting for prophetically is for the U.S., is for the U.S. working the U.S. government, the U.S. state, the U.S. nation, working through an alliance of apostate Protestantism allied with the papacy to restore life and power to the beast which is the Antichrist, that is to say, the Roman papacy. This process has already begun, and it will come to full manifestation through the daughters of the harlot church. That is to say, the Protestant denominations that are pledging allegiance to the Vatican. Now, it's, it's beyond the scope of this study to do a full analysis of the, the daughters of the harlot church and all of that. Uh, we'll touch upon some of it, but in more detail, uh, please go back to one of our early programs called The Mark of the Beast, and uh, you'll get a lot more background in that study. Okay, so we were saying that this process, this allegiance between apostate Protestantism allying themselves with the papacy has already begun. And it will come to full manifestation because the daughters of the harlot church, that is to say, the Protestant denominations, are pledging allegiance to the Vatican, embracing the traditions of man, forsaking the word of God as the ultimate source of truth, as the ultimate authority in matters of faith. They are letting go. They are uh, defecting from sola scriptura. And they are joining the ranks of those who say, unity for unity's sake, let's unite around the traditions of men. This is why the Protestant churches are symbolically referred to as the false prophet in the book of Revelation. When you read false prophet in the book of Revelation, that's what that means. So the Protestant churches are going to restore credibility and power to the papacy by uniting with Rome. Now, why does Rome need the daughters? A couple of reasons. Part of it is the intense pressure that Islam is putting on Catholicism in Europe. You know, right now there's a huge Islamic invasion happening in Europe. Invasion is the right word. I'm sorry, it, it's, it's fake news to call that immigration. No, this is an invasion that's happening in Europe, a Muslim, Muslim invasion. So the Pope is under pressure. He needs to have more allies because, uh, although he's trying to reach out to Islam, but clearly Islam has a very different agenda from the Pope's agenda. And so the Pope needs to strengthen his power base, and he is doing that by solidifying his ties to the Protestant churches. And the Lutherans led the way when they signed away their uh, protest by saying, you know, that sola scriptura is no longer the basis on which the Lutherans are going to uh, base their faith. All righty. Now, let's, let's move on. I just want to mention briefly, in June 2014, you may recall the evangelical meeting where Pope Francis made a video appearance with uh, Kenneth Copeland 
and a group of evangelicals who were united. Uh, Kenneth Copeland led the group in prayer. They prayed in tongues over the Pope and um, know what's happening now. So that's, there's been a continuous buildup, continuous uh, building of relationships. A group of Protestant leaders went to the Vatican. And finally, this is going to culminate in the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which dates back uh, to the times when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of a Catholic cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany. So this year, there's going to be a big celebration in the month of October, and all these leaders, uh, religious leaders, are going to get together to celebrate the end of the Protestant movement. And I feel saddened. It grieves my heart. So many of God's martyrs died for us to have the Bible. They died for us to have the Word of God. They were burned on the uh, stake as heretics, as witches. They were accused of all manner of abominations. And all they were doing was defending and preserving the Word of God, that they, could, that they would be able to live by the Word of God, and that their descendants would also have the right to have access, uncontrolled access, free access to the Word of God. And it breaks my heart that Protestants have, like we've had a lobotomy, or we have amnesia, or we have Alzheimer's, but we have totally forgotten who we are as a people, and we are just signing away the, the very foundation of our faith. But that, my friends, is what's going on. Now, Back to Donald Trump. So what's the connection between the Protestant apostasy and Donald Trump? Well, I don't know. It's a question we need to ask. I believe that the conditions are ripe for the beast's wound to be completely healed during Trump's presidency. That wound is almost healed, but that when that wound is healed, it means power is restored. Full political power is restored to the papacy. We haven't seen that yet. As we can see, by all these developments, the conditions are very ripe for that to happen. Now, so far, right, as of now, Donald Trump and Pope Francis don't seem to be each other's greatest fans. Their agendas are very different. If you look at Trump's stance on immigration, his nationalistic agenda, it's the exact opposite of what Pope Francis is lobbying for, which is uh, one world government, and no borders. So very completely, you know, completely different policies, completely different um, agendas. However, we don't know what will happen when Donald Trump, one hypothesis is when Donald Trump realizes the extent of the calamitous uh, state of our economy. You know, the Vatican is the richest state in the world. Donald Trump is a very smart businessman. What might happen, we don't know. We need to stay tuned and keep observing and keep watching what's happening. What we do know from Bible prophecy is that the beast with horns like a lamb that speaks like a dragon, that's the U.S., working through the false prophet, which is apostate Protestantism, will ultimately return power to, full power to the papacy, the beast, and will ultimately, that evil alliance, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, will ultimately impose religious persecution in America aimed against God's remnant people who keep the Ten Commandments and worship on the Sabbath day. The question that we can ask at this point is, of the two powers that are at war in this great controversy between God and the devil, Whose trump card will Donald Trump be, if any? Will the globalists ultimately succeed in removing Trump? We don't know. We shall see. The message of the trumpet. Two powers are at war in the universe and both may use the same agent to accomplish their purpose. So, we established earlier the deep significance of the word Trump. Prophetic significance as well. Is God trying to tell us something with President Trump's name? If so, what would that be? That the world is soon coming into judgment, as has been prophesied? 
that we're getting closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus and the end of the world? Well, the fact that God may or may not use Donald Trump's name as a sign doesn't necessarily mean that God is endorsing Trump's actions or that God is speaking or working through Donald Trump, although we can't altogether rule that out, right? But I do believe that the Lord is using President Trump as a sign, as a signpost on the way to the end, a final warning calling us to action. Now, you might wonder about that. Well, you might say, well, he's not a very godly man. He seems to have, you know, have a penchant for skirts and, you know, somewhat of a, some scandals in his past, some skeletons like every politician, right? But when we receive a message from God, we don't look at the messenger. We simply receive the message and we evaluate the message on its own terms. Is this truth? Is this biblical? Does it come from God? If the answer is yes, then we embrace the message regardless of the messenger. God spoke through a donkey, didn't he? And, I mean, God can speak through the most humble messenger. He can even speak sometimes through people that are not so holy. Let me give you an example in the Bible. Balaam, the prophet, who the devil tried to use to curse Israel, is a good example of someone who was used both by the devil and by God. So the devil was trying to get Balaam to curse Israel and God used, turned the situation around, used Balaam to bless Israel. Ultimately, if you read the story of Balaam to the very end, the devil turned things around and he saw that the, the sneakiest, smartest, most clever, most insidious way that he could use to come against the children of Israel was through infiltration. That's what he did to Israel at the time. That's what he does in the church. But the reason I bring this example up is because it's an example of both God and the devil using the very same person as a means to their respective ends. So what is God calling us to do? What is the message of the hour that God has for his people? Well, first of all, he's calling his watchmen on the wall to blow the trumpet. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This is in Isaiah 58.1. Here we see an example of um, the trumpet representing the voice of the prophet, the voice of the watchman speaking to the people, warning the people. So today, you know, the days of smooth and deceptive prophesying are over. The preachers and the teachers who deceive the people with smooth words will have their day of reckoning. They're going to have to account for their idle words. The book of Ezekiel chapter 3 clearly warns us warns us, watchmen on the wall, that if we fail to warn the people of their sins, whether it be the righteous or the wicked, doesn't matter, their blood will be upon our heads. Let's read the verse. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life? That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Ezekiel 3, 17-19. Then in verses 20 and 21, the Lord says the same thing about the righteous. I don't want the blood of anyone to be on me, righteous or wicked. Therefore, I don't speak smooth words. I blow the trumpet and I tell you the truth as it is stated in God's word. Okay, what else could the Lord be telling us? Well, God is calling the world and particularly his people to repentance Remember what John the Baptist preached. Remember what Jesus preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand.
Let's go to the book of Joel, one of the Old Testament minor prophets. The entire book of Joel is a very prophetic description of the last day, also known as the day of the Lord. And he also describes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will happen in the end time, the latter rain. Listen to what the trumpet announces in Joel chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Then the Lord continues, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. The Trumpet and the Hebrew Sanctuary This is one of the most critical parts of today's teaching. If anything, I'm using Trump as a springboard for us to talk about the sanctuary. In a previous program called Pattern of Heavenly Things, we discussed the prophetic significance of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary, not only for the Jewish people, but more importantly for our generation. The Hebrew sanctuary is the foundation of our Christian faith. The sanctuary was a system of types and shadows that symbolized the entire plan of salvation. It pointed forward to the ministry of Jesus, not only his death on the cross, but his perfect life in the camp, his resurrection at the laver, his intercession in the holy place, and the judgment taking place right now in the most holy place, his return in glory. All of this is symbolized in the sanctuary. So it is a representation on a small scale of the entire plan of salvation for mankind. What I'd like us to do now is to shine the light on this very important aspect of the trump and the trumpet as they are connected, as they are linked to the Hebrew sanctuary and to the Jewish feasts. But before we make the connection to the feasts, I need to give you some background because I want to establish clearly in your mind the importance of the sanctuary and its relevance to us as Christians. As I said, it's the foundation of our faith but also it's sort of the backbone of Bible prophecy for the end time. It's impossible to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation without understanding the ancient Hebrew sanctuary. You just don't get the full meaning. You do not accurately understand Daniel and Revelation unless you have the understanding and the knowledge of the sanctuary. So this is what I would like to impart to you now. And I know I have been so blessed through these teachings and this, this Bible truth, so many of the symbols and the cues in Daniel and Revelation come from the sanctuary. So let's go to the book of Hebrews, where the Apostle Paul explains the deeper meaning of the whole sanctuary system. Sometimes this system is even referred to as the Hebrew economy because the daily life of ancient Israel was totally structured around the daily uh, sacrifices, the daily offerings, the yearly sacrifices, the weekly Sabbath, and the yearly feasts. Now, aside from the weekly Sabbath, all of these other things, the, the daily and uh, yearly sacrifices, the Hebrew feasts, all of this was known as the ceremonial laws. 
The Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, is not part of the ceremonial laws. It is part of the Ten Commandments. It's the Fourth Commandment. So I'm going to talk about the ceremonial laws. Very few of the children of Israel, or even of the priesthood, of the Levitical priesthood, very few of them understood that the rituals and the ceremonies and the feasts and everything else that they did associated pertaining to the sanctuary held a deeper meaning. All of these were in fact pointing to the future sacrifice and the future ministry of the Messiah. Now, not only did the children of Israel and the priests fail to understand the symbolism of the sanctuary, but they also believed mistakenly that after the death of Christ, the entire ceremonial system was still relevant and still mandatory for all believers, including the Gentiles. So the Jews of the time of the disciples wanted to continue celebrating the Hebrew feasts. They wanted to continue offering the daily sacrifices after the death of Jesus, not understanding that the perfect sacrifice of Jesus rendered the entire sacrificial system absolutely unnecessary, totally irrelevant, and completely obsolete. The Jews, as I said, they even wanted to impose the sanctuary system on the newly converted Gentiles. So Paul wrote the book of Hebrews to rectify all of these misconceptions among the Jews. But this book, the book of Hebrews, New Testament book, is critically important for us to understand the importance, the transcendent importance and relevance of the sanctuary for us, even if we do not need to continue observing the feasts or doing the daily sacrifices because Jesus already sacrificed once and for all, but there is great meaning, great depth of significance in the book of Hebrews that we need to read and understand that will solidify our Christian faith. Let's, let's delve now into what Paul said. Paul explained that Jesus' perfect one-time sacrifice had supplanted the sacrifices, had supplanted, had replaced the sacrifices and the feasts and he explained in the book of Hebrews how at Jesus' ascension, the heavenly sanctuary had replaced the earthly sanctuary. That from its creation in the days of Moses, the earthly sanctuary was only a type and shadow of the real sanctuary in heaven. Let's read Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. Paul says, For the law, again he's referring to the ceremonial law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Then Paul goes on to explain, quoting Jesus, that God wanted no more sacrifices and offerings for sin as in the ceremonial law, because as we just read, the blood of bulls and of goats can't take away sin. Instead, the plan of salvation required a perfect, permanent, once and for all sacrifice in the body of God's Son. Let's read again from the scriptures. This is now in Hebrews 10, verses 9 through 14. Then said he, Lo, I do come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, referring to the animal sacrifices, that he may establish the second, referring to Jesus' sacrifice. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, referring to Christ Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, hallelujah, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 
For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So the blood of bulls and goats, the daily sacrifice, the daily offering for sin, could not perfect, could not take away sin, could not perfect those who came to receive perfection, those who came with the de desire to receive holiness, the, the blood of bulls and goats, those uh, daily and yearly sacrifices and offerings, could not give it to them. Only the blood of Jesus, only that one time perfect sacrifice for all mankind, only that can perfect us who are seeking sanctification. So these imperfect sacrifices that the Levitical priests were offering, they had to be offered continually, twice a day, and throughout the year. They had their, their milestones, they had their events on their calendar, and um, it, it was an ongoing thing because they were never clean. They were not cleansed ever. And so we understand that all of these sacrifices were symbolic. They were presented as a temporary substitute, as a temporary symbol for the future sacrifice of Jesus, and this is why they needed to be continuously re renewed. Even the cleansing of the sanctuary that happened once a year on the Day of Atonement, the feast that the Jewish uh, people call Yom Kippur, even the Day of Atonement was a yearly reoccurrence. The sanctuary did not ever get really clean. It had to be cleansed every year. So once Jesus' sacrifice was presented and it was accepted by the Father, the entire earthly sanctuary system became obsolete. Now the whole thing, the whole replacement, right, of, of the sacrificial system and the ceremonial laws being replaced by Jesus' perfect sacrifice hinged on one thing. It depended on whether the Father would pronounce Jesus' sacrifice acceptable or not. So the question is, was Jesus' perfect sacrifice accepted by the Father? The answer is yes. How do we know is the question, right? How do we know that Jesus' sacrifice was acceptable to the Father? Two signs the Father gave us. Number one, the tearing of the veil when Jesus died on the cross. God was making a statement. He was saying by the tearing of the veil that the Levitical priesthood had no more reason for being. And this was a, this was a, a gigantic veil. This veil was like 60 feet uh, long and very thick, very, very thick veil. It was totally rent when Jesus died. So God was making a statement that the Levitical priesthood had no more reason for being. It was obsolete. Its time had expired. The priesthood was now to be transferred to Jesus, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, and it was translated to the real sanctuary in heaven. This was the death of the system of types and shadows. All of this, including the, um, the priesthood of Melchizedek, that Jesus was ordained into, all of this is explained in Hebrews 7 and Hebrews 9, using maybe slightly different language. Number two, what was the second sign that the Father gave us that Jesus' sacrifice had been accepted in heaven? On the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire fell down from heaven. Remember, that was a beautiful, beautiful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire falling upon every disciple's head. This was symbolic of the way fire used to come down from heaven to burn a sacrifice or an offering when it was acceptable before God. This happened several times in the Bible. It happened to the children of Israel uh, during their wanderings in the desert. This is recorded in Leviticus 9. There may be other happenings as well. It happened to Gideon in Judges 6. It happened to King David in 1 Chronicles 21. And uh, most notably, it happened at the dedication of the temple that Solomon built, and that's recorded in 2 Chronicles 7. And uh, even more remarkably, remember when Elijah had the controversy with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18? And remember when um, Elijah said, why halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. So make up your minds, Israel. Who are you going to serve? And the Lord brought fire down from heaven to show 
uh, demonstrate to the children of Israel that he was God. And he shamed the prophets of Baal in the process. So in the same way, the tongues of fire that fell upon the disciples in the upper room signified that the Father had accepted Jesus' sacrifice. The end of the Jewish ceremonial law. In what we've just discussed, there's some potential for misunderstanding. So let's be very, very clear. First possible error. Regardless of what some Christian ministers are teaching on Christian television, we do not have to keep the Jewish feasts. There is no additional blessing. There is no surplus of reward for keeping the Jewish feasts. It's important to understand their symbolism as part of the overall sanctuary, which, as we said, is symbolic of God's plan of salvation for mankind. So God still operates according to his calendar, his divine calendar, which is the calendar of the Hebrew feast. So we need to understand them so that we understand the divine calendar and how events have unfolded for God's plan of salvation up to now and how they will continue to unfold until the end of time. But we do not have to keep or celebrate these feasts. That was the whole point of the book of Hebrews. That's why Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. He was telling the Jews, guys, we don't have to keep these laws anymore. The, the Levitical priesthood has been supplanted by the highest order of priest, which is the order of Melchizedek, to which Jesus Christ has been anointed. The Levitical system was replaced by Jesus and his divine ministry in heaven. The ceremonial laws were taken away and were nailed to the cross. That's what's meant. We said earlier, right, in Hebrews 10, 9. Let me repeat that. He taketh away the first, meaning God took away the ceremonial law of the recurring feast and the recurring sacrifices, that he may establish the second, meaning that he may establish Jesus' one-time perfect sacrifice once and for all. The Christian ministers who try to persuade us to keep the Jewish holidays, it may appear that keeping the Jewish holidays is a way to come closer to God. But in reality, it's a false doctrine. In reality, it's an insidious attack against Jesus. It actually undermines the high priesthood of Jesus. The priesthood of the order of Melchizedek is actually undermined when we try to keep the Levitical priests, which is of a lower order, as we've already established. Hebrews 7.12 states, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law, the ceremonial law. The law that was replaced is a ceremonial law and not the divine law, which is the law of the Ten Commandments. And the priesthood that was replaced again, let's say it one more time, was the Levitical priesthood replaced by the higher order of the divine priesthood of Jesus Christ, the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek, where Jesus is even now in the most holy place, both interceding for us as well as executing judgment. Right now, there is a judgment going on on God's people. Second error that is common, very important that we discern truth from error on this one. Please don't get confused between what was abolished and what remained. So what was abolished, let me say it one more time, and if I need to say it 20 times, I will say it 20 times, this is so key. What was abolished was the ceremonial law of the sacrifices and the offerings, which included the yearly Sabbaths, the sacrifices and the offerings that were offered daily, as well as the yearly feasts. This includes the yearly Sabbaths, again, not the weekly Sabbath, but the yearly Sabbaths, like the unleavened bread Sabbaths, the Pentecost Sabbath, the trumpet Sabbath, the tabernacle Sabbath, and the atonement Sabbath. All of those feasts are abolished. 
The weekly Sabbath, on the other hand, remains unchanged. It was not part of the ceremonial law. It was not given to the children of Israel as a consequence of sin. The fourth commandment, the weekly Sabbath, points not forward to the Messiah. It pointed back to creation. It was instituted during creation week, and it remains fully in effect. Remember that Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So the law that Jesus is referring to is not the ceremonial law, which did pass. Jesus is referring to the divine law, which is eternal. And he continues, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 5, 17 through 19. So again, the only law that was nailed to the cross was the ceremonial law of types and shadows that pointed forward to the Messiah. The Ten Commandments are still binding for all Christians. The Fourth Commandment, where God instructs us to keep the Sabbath holy, the weekly Sabbath, the seventh day, the seventh day Sabbath, not the yearly Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, that points back to creation. It was given to all mankind in the Garden of Eden. It wasn't for the Jews. It was for man. The Trumpet and the Jewish Feasts. All right, so we had to lay all that groundwork. Very, very critical, crucial, foundational uh, uh, understandings that you needed to have in order to understand now the significance of a very important prophecy in the book of Daniel related to the trumpet. This is both the longest time prophecy in the Bible and it's also the last prophecy given with a start and end date. So we read this prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 in an exchange that Daniel overheard in a vision and he himself didn't understand it. Let's read Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now we've already taught in previous studies that in prophecy a day equals a year. It's called the day-year principle of prophetic time reckoning. Therefore, the 2300 days given in the dialogue between the saints that Daniel overheard in his vision is not counted as 23 days, but as 2300, sorry, not counted as 2300 days, but as 2300 years. That prophecy started counting in the year 457 BC when King Artaxerxes signed a decree to both rebuild the Jewish temple and to restore Jerusalem's government. This is described in the book of Ezra, chapter 7. Now, if you count 2,300 years from 457 B.C., the 2,300 years end in October 1844 on the Jewish Day of Atonement of the year 1844, which is October 22nd. The Day of Atonement is the yearly feast during which the high priest, Levitical high priest, cleansed the sanctuary from the sins of the people that had accumulated during the year. This is what the two saints were talking about. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But as we said, the priesthood was translated from earth to heaven. The calendar was also translated from earth to heaven. 
And now the Lord Jesus is officiating as high priest of the order of Melchizedek on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. And what this prophecy was actually telling us, the prophecy that was given to Daniel, what it told us was that on October 22, 1844, Jesus moved from the holy place where he performed intercession on our behalf into the most holy place where he now is performing a work of judgment. The prophecy that was given to Daniel was not referring to any earthly sanctuary. Why? Because number one, there wasn't any earthly sanctuary at the time that the prophecy was given. Remember, Daniel was in Babylon, captive. The temple had been destroyed. So there was no earthly sanctuary at the time that Daniel received the vision. And there wasn't going to be an earthly sanctuary either when the time was fulfilled, when the prophecy was fulfilled. So this prophecy could only be referring to the heavenly sanctuary, which was the original, right? The earthly sanctuary was just a small-scale model, a replica of the authentic, the genuine, the original sanctuary, which was in heaven. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the sign that judgment has begun in heaven. This is why of the three angels' messages in the book of Revelation chapter 14, the first angel says, the hour of his judgment has come. So this indicates that this judgment has already started. Let's see the confirmation of that in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. This is where Daniel was, Daniel was given the vision of the judgment in heaven, and he shares that in his inspired book. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Daniel 7, 9 through 10. What does this mean for us? It means that right now we're living in a time of judgment. The cleansing of the sanctuary is the day of atonement, Yom Kippur in Hebrew. We currently, we end time generation, are living in a protracted day of atonement. In ancient Israel, the day of atonement was a day of judgment, a day of fasting, a day of repentance. Yom Kippur is the most sacred and solemn day of the Hebrew religious calendar. It's a holy convocation where all work is forbidden. That's why it was a yearly Sabbath. It was considered to be a yearly Sabbath and no work was performed on that day. It was characterized by the blowing of the shofar, which is the Hebrew trumpet. So here we get the connection to the trumpet again. This is why we're talking about this. It's because there is a connection with the trump of God. Yom Kippur is, in the, on the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur is celebrated on the 10th day of the 7th month, which is Tishrei. And Tishrei falls in September or October of our calendar. There are a couple of interesting facts about the Day of Atonement. First, unlike several of the other Jewish feasts, such as the Passover or Pesach in the spring that celebrates the deliverance from Egypt, Yom Kippur doesn't commemorate any particular event in Jewish history. Its only purpose was for God's people to assemble in prayer and fasting and to follow the movements of the high priest who was inside the sanctuary, inside the Holy of Holies cleansing the sanctuary with the blood of the sacrificial goat offered for that purpose. So, God's people would assemble to repent, to pray, to fast, to ask forgiveness. They would be outside the sanctuary following the movements of the high priest. They couldn't see the high priest, obviously, because of the walls and the veil. 
but they heard the tinkling of the bells because the priest would tie bells to the um, hem of his robe so that the congregation could listen to him walking around uh, inside the inner chambers and that they would know that he had not been struck down by the Lord, but that he was okay. What the priest was doing, we had described this in great detail in another study, the priest was sprinkling blood inside the Holy of Holies, inside the most holy place, sprinkling blood before, I believe seven drops as I recall, before the Ark of the Covenant to cleanse the um, Holy of Holies with this clean blood, this goat blood that was clean because no, no other sin had been put upon this blood. This blood only had the purpose of cleansing the sanctuary. So it was collective sin that was associated with that blood. It was, it was intended to cleanse collective sin and not individual sin. The second interesting fact about Yom Kippur, or about the Day of Atonement, is that it's preceded by the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is often called Rosh Hashanah. Its real name, however, is Yom Teruah, the Day of Blowing the Trumpets. It's celebrated on the first day of Tishrei, so um, Feast of Trumpets comes on the first day of the month of Tishrei, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, on the tenth day of the month of Tishrei. And the Feast of Trumpets is described in Leviticus 23, verses 23 through 25, and also in Numbers 29, verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work, it is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. So, Note this, for the Lord, the Day of Atonement was important enough for it to be announced beforehand by the Feast of Trumpets. Did you catch that? So God does nothing without warning his people. Whenever God is about to do something important, something significant, there is always a warning that precedes it. So the Feast of Trumpets precedes the Feast of the Day of Atonement. So God always gives advance warning before judgment strikes. Let's go back to the book of Leviticus now, and let's read about the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. So the Lord says very clearly, whoever um, is not afflicted in that day, whoever is not with the rest of the congregation, you know, a holy convocation, fasting, praying, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Now, why is all of this significant for us? What is the deeper meaning behind the Day of Atonement? This is the day that we're living in right now. We're living in an extended Yom Kippur, if you can fathom that. On the Day of Atonement of the year 1844, as predicted in that prophecy that Daniel overheard, the 2300-day prophecy, Jesus moved from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to the most holy place to cleanse out the sanctuary from sin, the heavenly sanctuary, to cleanse it from sin and to perform a work of judgment. The only way, let me explain how this works, the only way in which the heavenly sanctuary can be cleansed is by performing a work of judgment. Why is that? Because the record of our sins is in heaven. The record of our sins is kept 
in the Holy of Holies. Jesus is now in the Holy of Holies examining the records of the people of God. Those who will be found worthy, so-called people of God, self-called, self-designated people of God, right? So everyone who considers himself a Christian, everyone who professes to be a Christian, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, has their name written in the book of the Lamb, and is going to be judged in the Holy of Holies before Jesus comes. Their record, they will not personally appear before the judgment seat. Their works will be examined. Their record of their deeds will be examined in heaven. Once it has been determined whether they are indeed worthy to be saved, their record of sin will be erased. It will be blotted out because ultimately the heavenly sanctuary must be completely cleansed. No trace of sin can remain in that heavenly sanctuary. Sin must be blotted out completely. This is the ultimate goal of the plan of redemption is the blotting out, the erasing of every trace of sin in the universe, starting with the heavenly sanctuary. So that's what Jesus is doing. As somebody is deemed worthy to be saved, to go to heaven, then that person's sins are blotted out, their record of sin is erased, and they are perfectly and absolutely clean. They are blameless before the throne of God. Now, each person's sins are not erased individually, as that person's name is called in heaven, but collectively at the end when everyone's name has been called and everyone has come before the judgment seat and everyone who's been found um, saved has been identified, at that point in time, all of their sins shall be washed away, shall be blotted out by Jesus' work of cleansing. Jesus will sprinkle his own blood before the Ark of the Covenant in order to cleanse the sanctuary and blot out, completely remove all of those sins. That is the work that Jesus is doing right now. So God's people are being judged in heaven right now. Why is this judgment being performed? Why does God judge his people before he judges everyone else? Well, because there's a calendar. Because when Jesus comes back to earth to pick up his people, to gather up his elect from the four winds, right? Jesus needs to have demonstrated he knows who his people are. He knows who his faithful people are. He doesn't need the judgment. The judgment is for the benefit of the citizens of heaven who they need to be reassured that these people are safe to save. These people are not going to start rebellion in heaven. These people are not going to bring sin back to heaven. Affliction shall not rise up a second time. That is a promise in the book of Nahum. This is the purpose of the judgment, to reassure the citizens of heaven that we are safe to be saved. And this is what Jesus meant when he said in Revelation 22, verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, there's some additional confirmation that God still times key events according to the sanctuary calendar. And I just want to mention some contemporary confirmation of our, you know, of our day and age. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, I think, has made a very good demonstration of that regarding the seven-year Shemitah cycles and the Jubilee years. Another interesting fact, when the Pope came in 2015 to the U.S., um, his famous visit in September of 2015, he was received in the White House by President Obama on September 23rd, 2015, which was the Yom Kippur, it was the Day of Atonement of the year 2015. Again, I don't think that was a coincidence. So conclusion, 
What does this mean for all of us? It means we're living in a very solemn time. We are living in the day of judgment. This is a time of repentance. Repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a time of true seeking of the Lord. It's a time of prayer and fasting. We need to be afflicting our souls. We need to be investing all of our time in God's kingdom, not in the things of this world. The things of this world will burn up. Nothing, nothing will remain. Everything will be destroyed. The Bible says, for whatsoever soul it be, that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Leviticus 23, 29. I'm not surprised that the Lord is giving us a warning in Trump's name. We shouldn't speculate on the day or the hour. The only thing that we, you and I need to understand is that we're already living in the time of judgment. We need to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. That day will come as a thief in the night for those who are not watching, but for the children of light, it should not come as a surprise. None of us knows when probation will close for mankind, but we do know one thing. As was in the days of Noah, probation will close before the end. Probation will close before Jesus comes. When God closed the door of the ark, remember Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be during the time of the end, right? When God closed the door of the ark, Noah and his family and all of the animals were inside. It still didn't rain for seven days. So for seven days, Noah and his family stayed inside the ark. It seemed like a long time. Their faith was severely tested. Those who were outside mocking they didn't know that the door of mercy was shut. The door of the ark was shut. Had they even tried to repent, not that they ever did, but had they tried, it would have been too late. The door of mercy was shut. God's mercy has a limit. Their fate had been sealed. God was long-suffering. Noah preached for three generations, right? He, he preached for three times 40 years, 120 years. That's three generations. So, when it began to rain seven days later, the flood took them all away. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 39. The book of Revelation talks about the seventh angel, which has the seventh and last seal. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, listen carefully, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Revelation 10 verse 7. Here I'm deliberately using the NIV translation because it's a better translation of this verse. The NIV and the New King James have it right. Before beginning to blow the last trumpet, because some versions say when the seventh angel begins to blow the trumpet. No, no, no. It's before. It's when he is about to. He is poised to blow the trumpet. But before he does, before he does, the mystery of God, which is the plan of salvation, will be accomplished. The door of mercy is now shut. After that seventh angel begins to sound the last trumpet, that's it. That's the end. There is no more room for repentance. There's no more mercy. There's no more salvation. That is it. Who was saved was saved. Who wasn't saved wasn't saved. That's what Jesus meant when he said in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Let's go back now to the seventh angel. This is in Revelation chapter 11. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead. This refers to the wicked dead. 
that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. Remember, the ark contains the Ten Commandments. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. How do we prepare? The big picture of key end time events, as we've described it, as it's described in the Bible, is a beautiful tapestry that shows God's love for mankind. It's a tapestry of God's plan of salvation. It is perfect. It is beautiful. Nothing is missing. Nothing is added. It is perfect. The redemption story is woven into the fabric of every Bible story. It's woven into the fabric of every verse of Scripture. The burden of every verse of Scripture is the plan of salvation. How can we not surrender to a God who loves us so much, a God who has given so much to redeem us? How can we not love our Savior, who is the center of all Bible prophecy? But there's an enemy who's lured us into slumber. Wake up, wake up. The trumpet is sounding the alarm. The trumpet is the voice of God himself. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Amos 3.6 The blast of the trumpet should elicit godly fear. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, the Bible says in Philippians 2.12. God is calling us to repentance. God is calling especially His people to repentance. We have to forsake sin. We have to forsake the ways of the world. We need to seek Him daily. We need to do His work with whatever talents and resources He has gifted us. We need to congregate with other believers. We need to intercede for one another. Prayer needs to become a way of life. Fasting needs to become a way of life. We need to spend time in the Word to sanctify ourselves. Remember the Bible says, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. So we are sanctified as we study the Word of God. The Word of God is the only way to protect ourselves against the deceptions that Satan will bring in the end time, the counterfeit signs and miracles, the three evil agents, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet have frogs coming out of their mouth, lies, deception, false doctrine, all coming out of their mouths. Our only protection is scripture. As Jesus said, it is written. This is how Jesus defeated Satan. This is how we will also defeat Satan. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. We are living in the time of sealing. We're living in the time of sealing. This is so solemn. I'm sorry, this moves me to tears. If we are to be sealed, if we are to surrender our lives to the Lord, the time is now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time of sealing. If you procrastinate, if you hesitate, if you halt between two opinions, it may be too late for you. Right now, God is placing God is placing a seal on the foreheads of his faithful people before the winds of strife are unleashed. I pray for all of us, I pray for you, and I pray for myself, that we may all receive the seal of God on our foreheads, and that our names will never be blotted out from the Lamb's Book of Life.
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Thank you for listening to Setting the Record Straight, God's truth for this generation. If you've been blessed by this program, we encourage you to share it with others. To ask any question related to this Bible study or any other spiritual matter, email us at info at citybiblegroup.com. To find out more, visit our website at citybiblegroup.com. Hi, I'm Marla Ilana. Thank you so much for studying God's Word with me. Please click on the subscribe button below and you'll be blessed with many more powerful truths for our generation. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready?